professor. Um, I'm actually from Oman, so ah. I um, want to ask you a question. Sure. Mahaba. <laughs> I want to ask you a question on Oman. Yeah, please. Um, so my, I, I want to look at Oman as a case study, and I want to understand what went right, what went, what doesn't go so right there. Because in my mind, everything I've seen from the time I've grown up there, everything's gone right. Um, it's a peaceful country. It's a wonderful country where U.S. has had great relations with. Uh, I was around when the Gulf War happened. Didn't feel unsafe at all. Uh, I'm aware that U.S. has a free trade agreement with Oman. Um, it has multiple air bases in Oman. So I'm looking at Oman as a country as uh, it doesn't sound like it's a country that um, uh, U.S. had to tolerate. It sounds like it's a country that U.S. likes to have good relationships with. Uh, but from a strategic point of view, what is in it, what is in it for the U.S.? Um, so Oman's a wonderful country. I urge you all to visit it. Um, the, um, uh, it's, a, um, it's a sultanate. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not unlike uh, Saudi Arabia. The, the, the ultimate authority is in the hands of the sovereign. Um, uh, it's, it's not a democracy. It wasn't the democracy summit. Um, uh, uh, the sultan appoints ministers who carry out policies. Um, you're not allowed to criticize the sultan or his family, so there is a limit on free speech. However, the ministers are regularly criticized robustly uh, for, for bad policy. Uh, there are different levels of councils uh, where there are elections, uh, but unlike uh, in what we expect in the West, it's not the conservative party versus the liberal party. It's more like the distinguished businessman who, who sits, on, sits in the council. So it's a different, different culture. Um, I was um, um, intrigued by uh, the opportunity to live in a country where there is no expectation of of democracy, um, even in even in a place like Egypt or El, or well Egypt, huh? uh, not a democracy by any means, but in the background there was the expectation of a republic and a democracy that hasn't that hasn't succeeded. In Oman, just not there. Um, I talked to people. You know, what's the problem? I mean, how do you how do you how do you how do you live here? People weren't criticizing it. Uh, um, uh, in fact, at one point I got the answer. You know, if you have elections in this region, you get Khomeini and Assad. Yeah, yeah we don't want that. Um, thinking further aspect in uh, in Oman is that, um, whereas elsewhere in the Muslim world you have Sunni and Shia, there's the Ibadi, a kind of third denomination. And my sense, my my amateurish analysis is that maybe a three-legged stool is more stable than a binary opposition. Um, uh, there's um, a high degree of religious tolerance. Um, uh, uh, you're not allowed to criticize others' religion. Um, so what they have effectively done is choose for freedom of religion over freedom of speech. And I think probably in the United States we go the other way. Uh, I'm not sure how one could, why one would argue that one is ethically superior to the other. Um, the problem in Oman is that um, it um, is an example of suffering from the benefit of uh, natural resources. There's so much oil that Omanis in general are well off, and a lot of the labor is done by South Asians who are there on, um, on kinds of contracts. And there's a big difference, a big split in society. So, that, but this is typical for for the Gulf, and it's typical, frankly, for for the way uh, parts of Europe were, uh, Germany in the in the 1950s. Um, you know, wh what's in it for the United States? Um, uh, I think uh, uh, U.S. diplomatic relations with Oman are the second oldest in the, in the, in the Muslim world, in the Arab world. Uh, Morocco was first, then Oman. Um, uh, I think, you know, in, in, a, in a crude um, self-interest way, it's you know, strategically located. Yeah? It's a you know, very important location. Um, and in a region where instability is the norm, the stability of Oman seems uh, you know, pretty, pretty admirable. Um, it's not that there aren't problems in the country. Uh, it has economic problems. Um, uh, but um, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's breathtaking to be there in this sort of island of tranquility right next to Yemen, uh, which is hell.
Hi, my name is uh, Cameron Geller. I'm from Missouri, and I'm very interested in joining the Foreign Service, but I'm very curious your opinion on how the Foreign Service has one-year appointments in countries that are more extreme and then three-year appointments in most countries, and if that causes issues with uh, people being more inexperienced with certain cultures and policies and different politics in various countries due to being moved around so much. Where are you from in Missouri? Really close to Jefferson City, but it's a really small farm town. Yeah. Uh, I went to graduate school in St. Louis. Really? Yeah. Um, so that was a soft spot for Missouri. Um, um, the, um, uh, you know, obviously uh, there, there's a trade off. Uh, I, staying longer in a place allows you to develop better networks. Staying too long in the place runs the risk of going native, right? You're, you're too close, right? And that's why all countries rotate their diplomats. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, for, for particular difficult assignments, uh, in order to make it appealing to anybody, you know, they, have to, they have to cut it short. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is just the way the world is. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, you know if you if you're if you're interested in the wide world, uh, this is a this is a great career. Um, and you know again, great career serving your country. That's the value side. Um, on the prosperity side, what I saw foreign service officers doing is uh, end up as they become uh, a little older buying property in the Washington area. Um, then when they go overseas for three years, they can rent that out, and their, their, and their stay overseas is paid for by, uh, by the government. So it's a, it's a good deal as well. Hi, Doctor. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I actually had two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you mentioned that there are certain uh, agents that shape foreign policy, so I wanted to know uh, to what extent does the military industrial complex still shape uh, foreign policy? And Wait, can my you say that again? I didn't understand it. To what extent uh, does the military industrial complex ah. still shape foreign policy? And my other question was that to what extent does a uh, grand strategy for the U.S. still exist, considering it seeks, it seeks to dominate the world militarily, but also builds up rival powers through trading with them? like China and Russia in the 30s and 20s? Yeah. Um, I don't think the military industrial policy makes foreign policy. I think the Pentagon has a lot of influence on foreign policy because of the, um, the size of its budget and the, um, the, um, the, uh, the stakes that it has in certain, certain locations. Um, uh, the, um, Pentagon, parts of the military are very attached to the um, YPG, the, uh, the, the, the Kurdish um, group that is a bone of contention between the United States and Turkey. Uh, from my point of view, um, it would be valuable for the United States to um, try to address the concerns of NATO ally Turkey, um, uh, but uh, I believe the Pentagon hangs on <clears throat> to, to, to the Kurds uh, um, significantly. Another example is um, um, President Trump's suggestion that the United States should reduce its military footprint in Germany and move further toward, toward the east, toward, toward Poland. The military was up in arms in this. My f point of view is that the military is fat and happy in Germany. It's no longer a front state. There's no reason to be there except as a, as a backup. Um, you can't move it all out overnight, uh, but um, uh, our troops should be defending the Baltics and defending Poland and defending um, uh, the whole Eastern Front. Uh, there's not a big Russian threat at Oktoberfest. Uh, but, um, but, but, but there the Pentagon has a real interest. Um, the um, uh, second question was, uh, oh, grand strategy. Yeah, grand strategy, you know, we talk a lot, of, I don't think we have a grand strategy right now. I think we're, um, we're, 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 we're um, we've inherited a grand strategy um, uh, from the Cold War. Um, 
uh, think there was, uh, people never figured out the 1990s. Um, the, um, lots of opportunities were missed then. Um, uh, the, um, there's no formulation of a, of a grand strategic thinking at this point, and I think that's a deficit. And I think part of that has to do with the, um, um, the, the, the gap um, between um, uh, the government, uh, the State Department, Pentagon in particular, um, and um, uh, the American uh, intelligentsia class uh, that is really a, um, still a Vietnam War legacy um, uh, uh, for, for, I faced um, criticism for going to work in the Trump administration, but I think, I think, I faced criticism at the university. Uh, uh, but I think, um, in general, going to work Moving from, from, from university to, to Washington uh, is perceived as a betrayal of academic values. And that reduces the capacity to generate strategic thinking. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you f so much for coming to speak with us. Wonderful presentation today. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned. Um, a little while ago, uh, the hell that is uh, Yemen, and I would uh, agree with that statement. Um, so, uh, this is Yemen. Uh, the Yemeni civil war has devolved uh, into a war that doesn't seem to have any end whatsoever. Um, just a complete quagmire, and no one is suffering more than the Yemeni people. And the U.S. policy response to it has seemed scattered at the best. Uh, you have you have uh, policy resolutions in Congress uh, voting to cut off the Saudis for their human rights violations, but then the president doesn't really fully go through with that. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe talk just a little bit about the Yemeni civil war and specifically why, what has the U.S. policy generation been for it? Um, and what has the effect been? Thank you very much. You know, I don't think we've had much effect. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, there, there, there's, there's a real conflict there, but there's also an international competition uh, between Saudi and Iran, uh, ultimately between Russia and the United States. Um, uh, I believe the um, American foreign policy in many of the come hot spots in the, in the, in the broader Middle East um, has suffered from uh, a number of perspectival deficiencies. First of all, the, the absolute focus on post-9-11 Sunni terrorism means that other issues have, have dropped to the floor. Uh, in addition, the um, sort of the love affair with, um, with the JCPOA has meant that uh, um, there are lots of things we just won't address because it might um, uh, throw a monkey wrench into uh, whatever dire state the negotiations are in at, uh, at, at any point. Um, uh, I think the State Department's energy gets um, sucked up by a few top-level issues, so smaller countries, smaller issues, uh, just don't get the attention they deserve. In some cases, you know, Oman doesn't need that much attention. Things seem to be going well there. Uh, Lebanon, on the other hand, is a, is a powder keg. Uh, and uh, as I said at the beginning of my, uh, my remarks, uh, you know, Syria is the, uh, the, the humanitarian crisis of uh, the humanitarian shame, the catastrophe of the, of the 21st century. And um, you know, it just, we, we have no, no um, um, energetic initiative to, to stop this, even though it is um, destabilizing the region. Um, in 2015, about a million Syrian refugees came to Germany, and this caused a significant disruption in German politics and in the, the EU in general. I think if that hadn't happened, Brexit would not have happened, because Brexit wrongly thought that these refugees were coming to, to the UK. Turkey has 
three or four million Syrian refugees. Uh, there are no, millions of refugees in Jordan. This is, this is not gonna last. Uh, th this, this, this whole thing could blow up and the whole illusion that we're in a Westphalian game with stable states uh, could disappear. So I think it's, um, it's um, really unfortunate that the State Department can't generate the focus to address these, uh, these issues like, like Yemen.